Hi, I'm Carl Taylor. Welcome to Carl Taylor Education Live. Today, my guest is Jonathan Knowles. He is one of the world and UK's top advertising still life product photographers. But more recently, he's ventured into filmmaking and directing as well for commercials and various cross media campaigns. I'll be bringing Jonathan on live to talk to us, look at his work and answer your questions. We've got a torrential downpour on the roof at the moment, so hopefully that will ease up a little bit and you'll be, uh, be able to hear us a little bit more clearly. Um, before we kick off, let's just give you a bit of a taste of Jonathan's work and what he does. So there we have it, that is Jonathan's work. Now let me just see if I can find Jonathan. There he is, let's get him full screen, shall we? There we are. Jonathan, welcome back, how are you? Uh, thank you, Carl, yeah, great to be here. Um, all good in London, thank you. Excellent, and uh, we're having to do this remotely today because of the current situation. Last time uh, we were lucky enough to have you in the studio and we were discussing your back history, how you started as a stills photographer, mostly about your stills work. But today we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at your video work. Uh, yes, Carl, no, that's, that's right. Um, that's been something that's really been a very strong focus for us in recent times. Now, interestingly, I'm just going to come out of that and go over to your website. I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see what we're talking about at the same time. Let me just get all this working. I've got to manage several things here with these remote shows at the same time. Now let me just bring you a little bit bigger in the corner of the screen so our viewers can see you. Now this is the home page of your web of your website, uh, Jonathan Knowles, jknowles.com. And immediately now, what I notice as apparent from following you for years and years, is that the emphasis does, to, does seem to be very much more on the video. Even on the opening page, you're talking there about cross-media campaigns, and then we have an overview of film. Can you explain a little bit about that transition and what cross-media means for our audience, please? Uh, well, I mean, that's sort of an expression that really I was trying to sum up what it actually meant to be shooting stills and uh, doing filming for any particular campaign you know so to produce a suite of assets that is now required by any high-end advertising client so they need still need press and poster advertising as they always did uh, but as well as that they need uh, stuff for the internet uh, tv commercials um, that can run off the back of all of that sort of stuff so you know, I mean, it's a, it now becomes a truly integrated suite of image making and a full set of assets that clients really need. And, and how and when did you decide to make that transition? Because many of us that have followed you over the years have, as I say, known you as, as, as you know, 
preeminently as a stills, advertising stills photographer. When did you make that decision to move into film and video? Well, it was something that I'd seen coming down the line and it, you know, as more and more things were, as YouTube was becoming popular and other things were starting to happen, I was starting to see escalator panels uh, that were digital in the London Underground as well as the odd, you know, very rare digital billboard and suddenly, you know, I think I was then saw an, an ad for Harry Potter where the, the clouds moved in the sky, nothing else moved, but the clouds moved in the sky, just a little hint of movement. And you kind of think, well, this is coming, this is coming now. And uh, so in about, so I thought of this in 2010, 2011, in 2012, I got in a proper film crew to help me make my first uh, little digital assets as a personal project. And, um, because, and even in those days, I'm, I got them to shoot two of these three assets that we made in a portrait format, because my perception was even then um, that you know, I was seeing people wandering along looking at portrait bones and there were, um, you know, uh, and I was seeing portrait billboards, portrait escalator panels. I'm thinking, well, there's a, going to be a huge need for all this content. So I'm going to shoot these things, portrait, the film crew that were helping me thought I was absolutely bonkers. <laughs> I but, bet. Um, you know, because you make film this way, don't you? Yes. But, you know, how things have moved on now. Now we have to make it this way, this way and square as well. Yes, so, absolutely. Now, it, has this been something then? So you say a gradual evolution from around 2010, 2011, you started thinking about it. How long have you been doing it really seriously on sort of TV level as well now that you operate? I guess my first proper films were 2016 2017 um yeah 2017 i made my first cinema commercial first uh tv stuff uh, oh i directed i had directed a tv commercial for vodafone before that but that was you know a, a, um, a separate project right but, I mean, so that's... so about five years now four or five years you've been you know, working on that side. We're going yeah. to take a look at a couple of various clips and uh, images, etc., cetera, um, that I want to talk about. The first one you mentioned that was quite interesting there about the Harry Potter thing. And yeah. that was interesting because if we open this image that you sent me here, I'm just going to make this full screen as well. I think it's kind of similar to what's happening here is it just a little yeah. bit of motion a little bit of movement yeah that's right so we you know we shot the girl as a still and then we'd also shot the bath as, a, as some moving image and put the two together very simply right and this is this is quite a common practice now for digital billboards and advertising billboards just to catch the viewers attention i guess absolutely i mean and that's that's precisely that what are the ones that are on the roadside are obviously quite strongly regulated you can't have too much movement you could have that much movement you can't couldn't have um you know a big a big you couldn't have a jumping up so and, for um, safety reasons not to distract the driver you mean absolutely yeah right now when you sent me this image yeah uh, you called it a cinemagraph is that the the correct phrase for these type of things yeah this kind of thing where predominantly it's still but there is some element that moves uh, you know you can make these things in different ways but uh, yeah they're generally known as cinemagraphs so in terms of the manufacture of these for our audience to just to get a better understanding, if you're shooting it as a still, because there's the still image, the lovely still image of the, the model in the bath, how do you do the video element as well? Uh, well, in, on modern DSLRs, you can do it all in one go, can't you? Because yes. you just switch your camera to movie mode um, and film it. So you've got exactly the same perspective, exactly the same lens and, um, and you, you can just you can literally just, do right, one so you, part over so the you, other. Yeah. Part do does, that mean, does that mean that you have to work in continuous lighting for the still shot, or do you change the lighting uh, after you switch from stills to video? Uh, I generally change it. Change uh, the lighting, uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I prefer my stills to be shot with flash, but that's maybe that's because that's just how I've grown up. And yeah, I, I, I agree, yeah, years. absolutely. Right, now let's have a look at um, a really good film that caught my eye that you produced. Um, for, uh, is it Ben Riak? Is that how you pronounce it? That's correct, yes. Ben, ben Riak Whiskey. We're going to take a look at this, this film. Um, it's a beautifully crafted uh, film about this particular whiskey. Uh, and then Jonathan uh, will answer your questions. And also, 
Uh, you've got a great little behind the scenes uh, film as well on this one. So let's, uh, let's get this film going. And then if you guys have any questions, fire them in. It's the places we've been and the experiences we've had that make us what we are today. This is true in life, but it's also true in whiskey. And so, although every Ben Rieck single malt, be it our classic style, smoky, or triple distilled, is created in Speyside, our character comes from all over the world. By way of these rare and eclectic treasures, riches from across the sea, once filled with the finest sherry, port, Jamaican rum, Marsala wine, Kentucky bourbon, now just filled with endless possibility. And then we give those flavours time until they're finally ready for you to discover. With layer after layer of orchard fruits, malt sweetness, spiced oak, and much, much more. Ben Rieck brings you a true world of flavour. Now, to me, Jonathan, that looks extremely complicated. Tell us about the, the process of what you have to go through to manage a project like that and create a project like that. Uh, well, it starts out with a pro, uh, an approach from the advertising agency um, uh, with simple concepts. Um, then we have a discussion. Uh, there's also at that point probably not quite a storyboard, but we know we're going to make a 90 second film, some of it in studio and some of it on location. And from there, we chat a little bit more. Um, then the agency sent me a more detailed proposal document and we then cost that up in it. And that would be a competitive bid in general um, with uh, at least probably two other people at mm. that point. And um, this, this project was also stills, video, social media, cross media. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yes. And then a lot of the, the film that we did uh, was also recut by the agency themselves into some talking heads films that we filmed up at the distillery. Uh, we interviewed three key personnel, made films about each of those. Um, and yeah, some yeah, USP thing talking about specific aspects of the different products. Mm. So we filmed all the material that uh, created those as well. Uh, it's, a it's a beautifully crafted video. And what, what I really liked as well, because in your behind the scenes film that we'll look at in a moment, um, there's obviously a lot of it on location, but a lot of it done in your studio as well. Yes, that's that's right. Yes, I mean, I mean, a lot of things are best done in the studio if you can to to keep everything controlled and uh, and make sure you can repeat certain things. I mean, location, you know, a lots of it we had to do on location, obviously because we needed the beauty of the distillery itself, those beautiful old casks and mm. and the key personnel that we also wanted to film and interview. So. Okay. Um, well, let's take a look at the uh, behind the scenes video. I'm just going to share my screen um, with you again. And let me just get this ready. Let's close that one down and open up the next one. So the next video we're going to see is how Jonathan and his team made that video. And uh, it's quite inspiring what goes into a production like this when you see uh, this behind the scenes video. And action.
kita Amazing. I, I really enjoyed that. that. That video is as well crafted as the actual video itself. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, the person who did it for us was, yeah, she was a, a great, um, a great talented filmmaker. Yeah. Very, uh, very, uh, very inspiring. Um, let's just bring you back up uh, full screen. We've got a couple of questions come in from uh, the audience. First one is from Andrew Henning. Uh, Andrew asks, can I ask what the split is between shooting and editing uh, in terms of the time used for an advertising film? For example, is it two days shooting, four days editing? Uh, that's a very hard question, isn't it? Um, depends really on the, on the campaign, what, what we're actually trying to do, how much footage we've shot. Um, I mean, that Ben React whole campaign took us i mean in theory i think we were logged down for about 12 days of shooting but it actually took us more we we did overrun in the studio quite a long yeah. way yeah you know, i mean that's that's the joy of 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 having my own studio is that you know if it takes us a little bit longer to get the right shot then we we keep going absolutely and, um, but it's uh so i mean and then the edit process we go into, I would at that point then go into a first edit with my editor. We send it off to the creative director. He would put his feedback in. So a lot of this stuff takes quite a long time, though maybe not heaps of time in actual days, but mm, it happens a over a forth. very long time because there's so many people who need feedback. And then when the creative director's happy, we then send it to the client. And the client undoubtedly has feedback, which we address and send back. Um, and at certain points, then, you know, when we feel we've got it to a certain level then we'll get the composer involved because we had that soundtrack specifically written for that piece and uh um so and then once the soundtrack was right then you get the vo done and then the vo the soundtrack's then going to be remixed to go with the vo so you know there's lots and lots of stages <laughs> is it a lot more complications than shooting just stills then <laughs> uh yeah yeah i mean particularly you know when uh, you know Sometimes we think back to the days when, you know, when we didn't even handle retouching or, you know, I mean, even up to about 2000, you know, my entire portfolio didn't have any retouching in it at all. You know, you can think, well, in those days, you know, we just shoot the film, get the film processed, stick it in an envelope, get it on a courier off to the ad agency, goodbye. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Now, now, you know, I mean, the chances of that are almost zero now. I mean, you know, things can go on for weeks and weeks, as, uh, particularly if we're overseeing the post-production or the retouching. 
But, you know, that's part of the entire process. And, you know, that that's, uh, you know, as much as important to get that right. I mean, you know, we just, I mean, one likes to try and think that we are as fastidious with that as we are with the actual um, image capture. Don't let, you know, not I've letting anything you know. I've got more questions here for you, Jonathan. Um, this one's from Marco. He says, is Jonathan shooting these with DSLR mirrorless cameras or more specialized video equipment? Uh, it's more specialized, certainly all the slow-mo stuff. We're using a Phantom Flex 4K for that, um, which can shoot uh, in full frame, uh, 938 frames a second in full full 4K, a thousand frames a second, and. 2k uh 2k 2000 frames a second wow um i mean it just does mean uh you get humongous amounts of data uh but uh you know it's good to have it hmm. the that that would be used specifically or primarily for the slow-mo what would your more generalized filming shots be um accomplished um, with well, most of those we shoot on a red red, red. okay i mean I've, I've got a an older red and then if it's a certain type of shoot then i'll get in the dop who's got a more modern red that he brings with him um question from georgie she says where did you get that bad ass green velvet jacket from <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's quite quite old it's, it's <laughs> it was a uh, it's been in it was in the cupboard for i wore it and then it was in the cupboard for years and, it, and then it came out again so uh, yeah it's um looks it cool <laughs> <laughs> um allison asks i'd like to know if there is a comprehensive course specifically for photographers i'm a food photographer on expanding into video uh, if carl or jonathan does one even better well actually uh allison I, I i may tap jonathan up for a future course on uh, on video production at some point in the future right let's move back uh to my questions uh, what were the biggest obstacles for you in this transition to video and what skills as a top stills photographer did you bring with you um obstacles i guess were just sort of the mindset moving from stills to moving but you know once once you get over that the fact that a moving image camera is really just a stills camera it still has uh, an f-stop and it still has a shutter speed and an iso uh, it just takes more pictures every second um so technically once once that was once we were over that as a mindset thing um uh, as a stills photographer, what I think we can bring to it, I mean, and certainly as a stills photographer who worked a lot on film before the digital era, um, a lot of those skills that we developed on film when you couldn't just Photoshop everything um, were very useful when we're getting into filming filming things because you need to be able to light things correctly and then as the camera moves or the shot moves, you know, that um lighting needs to still work um whereas if you you know if you're used to putting everything together in photoshop then that is a little bit more of a problem yeah i think that's one of the key things i've seen with the the videos that you've produced as you know you've always been fantastic with your lighting on your stills and it seems that you know really good stills photographers are able to transport those lighting skills into video that really gives you know an a professional level to video that some other video producers fail to create so um that the lighting definitely seems to be uh, part of the process i'm just bringing up a few of your stills for our audience to see some of your stills work as well at the same time um, my next question is previously the sort of work um, for example in that ben react video um, that used to be reserved for big production companies um, and we see from your behind the scenes videos and some of the other ones that I've looked at that some of your projects only uh, have a few crew and some have many. Do the big production companies look at you with envy or are they now using your services too? Um, well, I think, you know, to a certain extent, we still pitch in a different market. Um, a lot of the time, I mean, we 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 have the right amount of crew on the on the set for what we need to do. But I mean, as, as stills photographers, yes, I think, you know, I'm sure you would know as well, Carl. And it's you know, we're we're pretty ingenious and and try and be as efficient as we can. Mm. So, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of the time, I don't need a load of crew to you know, if the, a lot of my sets in the particularly in the studio are relatively tight, so I don't need 
uh, to have a gaffer and a grip and whatever to help us rig the lights because you know we have the lights here and we plug them in you know so absolutely um a lot of the, those those kind of crew that you would see in the bigger film sets and you know and if i were to go to a huge studio and run a big film set then yes i'd probably have those people as well but um, most of the time we don't need them so you know we and, that, and uh, that's what i find fascinating about it because the 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 type of material that you're turning out there um, and the, the quality of the videos and TV commercials, you, you know, you're doing this with a sort of much more slimline crew than was conventional 20 years ago for a television commercial. There used to be a, a, you know, a much bigger deal in many ways in terms of the production, and yet the results you're getting uh, are astounding and, you know, right up there with the best. Yeah, I mean, we're we're on a TV shoot today, actually, that I'm taking a little break from, and I'm in the studio with my one assistant. Fantastic. So. <laughs> um, right, now, let's have a look, see if we've got any more questions here. We have um, someone, uh, Don Tijam, is saying, are all of these shots original, or is there some stock footage used in any of the video? So, for example, in the Ben React video, was that all footage that you shot for that particular client? Yes, that was, yeah, everything was shot. Great, fantastic. Um, Ethan Davis says, hi, Carl and Jonathan. Has COVID had an adverse effect on your business? And has it influenced whether clients are wanting more video or photography? Um, it's very hard to know the, because you can't run the control experiment, um, very hard to know on what touch wood for us. We've been relatively busy. Um, I mean, we now have a pretty robust remote shooting setup. I mean, as I say, there's, you know, my, just my assistant and I are in the studio today and the people who we're working with on this TV commercial are remote. Um, we've also had clients, uh, you know, from places that, if we weren't shooting remotely, I wonder whether they would have come. So, right. Um, so it could be a bit of a uh, bit of for so there and be against a bit of both. Yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm sure lots of lots that there has been a slowdown in lots of um, lots of things. But um, but I don't know whether I would have been busier or less uh, uh, less busy if if COVID hadn't happened. Hard. I mean, there's lots of things that we now have to do that um, to just to keep everybody happy that. Uh, that uh, you know to comply with all the rules that um, that we didn't used to have to do, obviously. But um, you know, we are where we are, so um, you know we're obviously trying to keep anybody who visits the place as uh, safe as we can. Yeah, um, the one I've got up on screen now. I'm not sure if you can see it or not. The famous grouse one. Um, it's almost a mix of stills and video because it looks like the opening image. Uh, it could be a still or it may be video. I'm not sure. Let me just bring that up again. Uh, and really? then obviously there's a little bit of video coming into it as well. Tell us a little bit about this one, please. Um, yeah, this was a social media campaign for Famous Grouse. We did three simple films about smooth, balanced and well-rounded, I think. Um, and yeah, the opening sequence was common to all of them. And that was a simple pack shot. I mean, it was a still. Yes, it was a still. And then yeah. we did the moving image works really well really well superb and then the That's footage the benefit of the 100 megapixel Hasselblad isn't it you can when you're delivering in 2k you can zoom right in yeah so. <laughs> absolutely right let's have a look at another one this video is a great uh, another great piece I'm going to run this one just shrink you down a little bit in the screen corner there and let's take a look at this one. Glenn Fiddick, Fire and Keen. Campfire smokiness. Toffee sweetness. Question convention. Spark the unexpected. Fantastic. Now we've got some more questions, uh, Jonathan. Let me bring you back full screen. Um, let me just figure out how to do that. I don't know if I can. I'll have to stop screen sharing here. There we go. Then we can go full screen. So let's take a couple more questions. Uh, question from Neil says, how much creativity is Jonathan allowed to have when making an advert 
um, in particular as to what shots to film or how to shoot them, or is it all very controlled by the client? Um, well, it, again, that depends on the client. Uh, lots of the time, yes, it's, it is quite controlled and it's very well scripted. Um, other times, yeah, uh, we can decide how to put together the edit and what shots go in. I mean, the Ben React film was quite flexible, really. I mean, we had a, a very tight storyboard, but then when it came to the edit, we just worked, worked out what worked best at which point. Um, and certain shots went in at certain points where they were in the original script and then moved around. Some shots were dropped. And yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, we I think there were 49 shots in the final edit and we shot, you know, shot way more than that. And, and during the process. So, so, for example, when you headed up to the distillery, which I assume is in Scotland somewhere, was it? Um, it is Bayside, yes. When, when you head up there and you see the place and then you start the process of following the storyboard, do, do things happen where you think, oh, hold on a minute, that looks amazing over there. Let's go and, you know, do you ever, does it ever diversify a little bit based on what you just see and start visualizing? In that particular case, on location, yes, it can. I um, mean, and, and it depends again on the client, but we had, a, we had a list of shots that we needed to get. And it was a case of how we went about getting those shots and the angles and things were pretty much left to how we worked it out on the hoof on the shoot okay. um so yeah and you know sometimes we t did several shots that would cover a certain uh a certain I uh, line item on the on the shooting schedule but um but that yeah that was more flexible but you know other times everything has to be really locked down by the client before you even go right so Depends all on the project in hand. Uh, Laszlo Hajas says, Dear Jonathan, do you ever use Broncolor LED F160 continuous lights for your video work? Thank you very much. Um, I have got some Broncolor LEDs, and to be honest, I'm not great with um, numbers, but I, uh, they're... Yeah, they, are they, I think they, the LEDs are the F160s, yeah. 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 I've, got, I've got five of those, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. Next question from Adam Colvin. Um, what would you recommend for someone on a low budget with no crew or just one or two people to get started? Would there be a market for this? How would someone, uh, you know, starting out wanting to do a bit of video, any tips for them? Um, well, I think you've just got to get yourself a portfolio together, shooting things that you enjoy shooting, and then that will hopefully come through in the work and people will commission you to Mm. to do the kind of work that you want to do yeah um i mean that was really you know i mean as as we discussed i think on my on your previous show i mean you know i just really followed my passions and fascinations and um and got my portfolio therefore followed that um and i think it's interesting as well i mean i know from from the video we produce here for the education platform some of the cameras that are available now like the recent sony a7s3 is yeah. as capable as the top Sony camera that was sixty thousand dollars ten years ago. So, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the technology now is, you know, I mean, it might seem like a lot of money, but I mean, in terms of what we used to pay for it, yes, I mean, it's 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 very affordable. I mean, you know, when you mm. kind of think back to the days of film, I mean, I was spending five thousand pounds a month in the film shop and five thousand pounds a month in the lab. You yeah. Know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to make yeah. at, at twenty five thousand look pretty cheap, doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly did. After well, on the first year, I remember. Yes, for sure. Um, right. Let me just have a look at my uh, my questions. Uh, what would you say is the most difficult part of working with video? Um, well, the volume of data. I think when we're talking about the sort of stuff that we do, when we're talking about a lot of slow motion stuff. So you need a lot of hard drive space. We've got loads of hard drives. I mean, you know, we, we, we amused ourselves in, in 2020. We used the same amount of hard drive space as I used in 12 and a half years shooting stills. Wow. In one year, you mm -hmm. used the same amount of hard drive space for video that you did for 10 years of shooting films. 12, 12, 12, yeah, 12. years of shooting film. Yeah. Wow. Um, what do clients expect or want from cross-media campaigns what is the what is what is the approach now of the client or the agency coming to you 
Uh, they want a consistent look across the entire suite of assets that they uh, want for their marketing. So, yeah, they want their posters and their TV commercial and their, uh, their social media assets to have the same look and feel. And they want to be able to repurpose them pretty easily and swiftly. So what we supply has got to be um, in, a, in a form that can be re-edited and recut or um, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a versatile way, you know, all your Photoshop files have to be layered and your, you know, to an extent your video files, if you're supplying, you know, you'd supply the project and so they can recut it or whatever as well. Well, is um, it interesting you mentioned that because this was another interesting one. You've got this San Miguel shot that you did here, which I assume was the, 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 the poster uh, billboard style shot. But then yeah. you've got another very interesting version that's almost identical, but it's just got a little bit of the moving bubbles in it. It's got moving bubbles. The sun moves as well. Um, ah, right. OK. So when, when it gets to 24 degrees, you see it, the, it, the, it pops up, tells you in Hammersmith it's 24 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> so so this yeah. is this for a digital billboard that, that, that so, we see now commonly on the bus station, bus stops and things like that? That, that was a digital billboard that ran um, and it was temperature triggered. So it wouldn't, the ad wouldn't even show until it was 20 degrees centigrade. And it would tell you, so it popped up the temperature on the top right there. And it would tell you, you know, where, wherever you were. I mean, there were, I think there were 800 or 900 different executions of this thing. I mean, I don't know quite how the agency managed that, but it, but, and then there were also versions that would, tell you where the closest San Miguel supplier was, whether that's a local pub or the local supermarket. Or, <laughs> Brilliant. Um, yeah, so it was all very, very locally targeted. So yes, the one up the road from here, from the, the road from the studio, did actually show the temperature in Hammersmith and it pointed to the pub that was right by the... Uh, by Fantastic. The, by the Telling you that it's hot enough that you need a San Miguel beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, was, yes, and all of that is now very precise. So yeah, so we we for that we supplied the final moving piece um, and uh, a, a suite of assets that enabled them to just customize the every execution. Okay, uh, many of the top photographers around the world now seem to involve themselves in video. Where do you see the future of high-end stills photographers? that will only do stills is is are they going to die a death if they don't adapt to video as well um i think if you're very famous and that's your position then you're going to be okay or if you do something particularly niche uh you're going to be okay but um in advertising now i can't remember i mean it's a long time since i had a brief that was just a stills brief really right yeah. So nearly all of the, the shoots or commissions that you get involve this cross-media approach. Oh, you know, even if it's just a little bit, you know, just like, well, that's like the San Miguel where they just wanted, you know, the sun to move and a drip to run down the beer glass, you know. Yeah. It was, but for the digital billboard aspect. Wow. So the digital billboards are really one of the, the key drivers on this. They were one of the first things to appear, were they, to, to start forcing this? Well, um, well, uh, uh, alongside Instagram and Facebook, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, where people didn't really want to spend the money for an Instagram film or a Facebook film that they used to spend on a TV commercial. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that I think probably social media was more of a driver than than uh, than the, the digital billboards. I would say, but I mean, that's just guessing. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Um, if photographers like yourself can now handle so much of the process, is there a reduced need from the clients for an ad agency or an art director? No, because the ad agency is still fulfilling its traditional function in uh, coming up with the big, the big idea. Yep. Um, the various executions, you know, doing a lot of the basic scripting, storyboarding before we get on board. So. You know what we're doing is taking on the functions of of, of say a TV production company, uh, you know, film production company. Mm. A lot of the time, that would you know where they'd have split the stills campaign between us and a and a TV production. Um, now we can do the whole lot. So, so it's more it's more the production companies that um, that we 
that we are, we're kind of treading on that role. Bit, yeah. yeah. So the ad agencies are still in charge of the ideas and maybe the market research that goes behind the ideas. You're executing well, and, and all the all the post production aspects that involve distribution of all this huge array of content. Of I mean, you know, that all needs to be managed and it's a huge, huge thing, particularly on worldwide campaigns. I mean, all the toolkits, particularly on something like, say, Ben React, where, you know, we shot these, I think in the end, we shot about 18 different press ads, if you count the landscape and the portrait executions, and they all have to be translated into goodness knows how many languages and all yeah. of that put on a big <laughs> portal that everybody can download with design guidelines. And yeah. so, so you definitely don't want that headache as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. No, no. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, that's uh, that's one thing I really don't need. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question from Kevin says, uh, "Thanks for your time today, Jonathan. Do you do your own uh, video editing, or do you use a regular editing team, or is it in-house or out-house?" Um, we have various people that we use, various different um, what we'd call offline editors to do the basic edit and then depending on how complicated it is whether we take it out to a, a big high-end uh, post-production house or whether we can still do that with our um our guy who, who we do a lot of our editing with who's a very skilled color grader and um can do some very simple vfx himself so so whilst you're in control of the process directing and lighting and looking at the film you obviously can't do this totally on your own. I know you said you're working in the studio today on a commercial with just one assistant, but this does require, you know, outsourcing a little bit more specialist skills here and there as well, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, but it's much the, the same case that I don't do my own photoshopping because, you know, I'm not practiced enough at it and to do it on a world class level, you need somebody who really knows what they're doing. But, you know, and I haven't since they invented Photoshop, I haven't had the time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's something for when you retire, Jonathan, you can uh, dabble with Photoshop at that point. Absolutely. Well, no, I can obviously do all the basics, but yeah, I wouldn't want to be saying, yes, I can retouch your advertising campaign to a very high level. Yeah. Right. right. Um, but I have lots of people that I use for that. I mean, I have one primary retoucher and, you know, and other people that I also use. Okay. Um, McCreevy Photo says, are there any mistakes you made when you first approached video? Anything you look back on and think, I should have done that differently? Ooh. Um, I'm sure there are. And I'm sure, I mean, much as we all learn, I mean, yeah, I mean, you look back at any project and think, uh, yeah, I should have done something differently or better. And if you stop thinking or feeling that, then I think maybe it's time to retire. Yeah, I mean, I think everything I yeah. look at and think, oh, yeah, I should have done that or should have thought of that or should have. Yeah, yeah. That's, so. uh, th that's a natural uh, course, really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, now, much of your work film, uh, your film work features beautiful, silky slow motion, great camera movements. What is the technology behind that? I know you spoke about the phantom camera for the slow motion, but are you using any robotic arms or robotic control for some of the motion? Yeah, we use, yeah, we quite often get motion control in. Um, and it's not something we actually have, but we, we have guys who do that and specialize in that. And uh, programming those things is, again, another skill right. that, um, that you need to have, you know, that you need to be really au fait with. And we wouldn't want to be trying to learn how to do that on a big ad shoot, certainly, so that you get people in who are, who are good at it. Um, Marco Campagno says, Hi, Jonathan. Despite you already having an amazing portfolio, do you still have fun shooting and experimenting in your spare time? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Good. Yeah, we, yeah we're always, uh, we've always got, uh, I mean, my main assistant is in every day and yeah, we've always got a few little things on the go. So, right. Excellent. You know, not, we're not doing commercial work. Um, Vera says, hi, I have a question for Jonathan about treatments. Do you personally, as a still life photographer and videographer, put together treatments for clients? Would you say they are more useful and important for the video parts or equally important for stills campaigns? Uh, well, now, yeah, I mean, most, most advertising campaigns, we'd have to do as treatment, whether it's just stills or stills and video or just video. Um, it's 
sometime i mean it used to be something like once you got the job you did one and now it's all part of the bid process so um yeah so we're you know we know that we're one of three bidding for a job and we're still having to spend a long, lot of time doing a treatment right. so um question from me lighting for stills is predominantly achieved with uh high speed bursts of flash what sort of lighting do you need for your film work and how do you find working with continuous light compared to flash? Um, well, obviously, yes. I mean, we're, the, the film work, we are using continuous lighting. Um, to be honest, it's, it's lighting, isn't it? It's light. I mean, it does the, same, does the same thing. So, yes, I mean, yeah. it still travels in straight lines and reflects the same. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's a bit different but it's, um, it's fine. I mean, I, 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 yeah, you look at it and you see it and mm. that's yeah, the key skill, isn't it? Much, much the same as we did on stills. Yeah. Yeah. Ob observing it is the, is the key skill. Um, and then, you know, the joy of the modern era is that we do have instant playback. You know, you're not, you're not waiting for film rushes to come back or, you know, or even for film to come back from the lab, you know, very you true, very true. Way. Um, I'm going to play uh, a little uh, commercial here. I'm going to just share my screen with you. And then um, I wonder if you could share with our audience a little bit about this particular project and how you made it happen and how the shot came about. I really, I really love that one. So, I mean, what we're seeing there at the very start is obviously the camera's pulling out, um, the bottle's falling, a really interesting camera motion there, and then the whole thing bouncing into the air, and then the, uh, the other little components. And then obviously at the end, it's all lovely and static and, and, and still to see. Tell, tell us a little bit about the behind the scenes or the work that goes into something that is maybe a little bit more closed in rather than the big production of, you know, out and about everywhere. Um, well, yeah, the, the, the main concern on that particular one was that making the bottle land. <laughs> um, we knew we had to film it coming in. Um, with a bit of an impact because we wanted to get uh, the liquid disturbance in the top of the neck and that kind of thing. So, yeah, we we had a rig so we could speed it in, but it still was, you know, getting it landing straight was a challenge. Yeah. Um, the uh, the jump up once it had landed was something as simple as um, yeah hitting hitting the set with a sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that's something I've wanted to do many times. <laughs> Hit the set with a sledgehammer. I like it. I like it. Let's see if we've got any more uh, questions come in here. Um, Daniel says, what diffusion materials do you use for stills uh, or video or and video? Um, well, I mean, it's I mean, lots of heavy frost. I mean, that's 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 my kind of real go to, I guess um, we get through rolls and rolls of it. Yeah. And the great, great thing is when you're doing um, lots of splashes and things like that and it gets covered in uh, gunk, then you can just, just cut it off the roll. Right away. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think we use the the the, the Lee Frost 216 and um, and 400s, but uh, I guess, I assume you might be using the same or something. Some people prefer yeah, yeah, the well, again, again, Carl, as I said before, I'm not very good on the numbers, but yeah, yeah. It's, it, it says heavy frost on the label. <laughs> It'll oh, be... look, the roll there, 129, 129. One, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's have a look at uh, the next clip that we've got here. Um, this, I really love this Grolsch clip here. Let's take a look at this. Now, now I have a curiosity about this one. So this question is from me, is how was it possible to make that lid pop open 
because I know it takes quite a lot of force to push those Grolsch bottles open like that. How, is it, how are we able to do that without anyone pushing on it? Uh, we had a special effects person who built a little rig um, where we had a little bit of a lever on the back of the bottle of the of the the scaffolding there yep. that's on the shoulder, and sort of something that effectively looked like a bike brake, but you know we could so we could pop it open. I mean there was so there was a cable, a small cable that you saw that I mean we had to take out of maybe half a dozen frames and that's all you ever saw so essentially it was like a little hidden contraption at the back of the bottle yeah yeah right um and then and the other thing is that you know you also want the label to tear in a nice way and so how do you make that happen um because you know a lot of the time the labels don't tear in a very nice way yes uh, yeah so you needed a nice clean break at yeah. that point there yeah exactly and the explosion of the vapor and the mist coming out of the bottle, was that natural or do you have to add additional elements to the bottle to give it a bit more gas? Uh, that was natural with a little bit of shaky help. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, right. Let's have a look here. Some more questions. Andrew Henning says, where would you recommend a focus for investment, investment be for a videographer? camera equipment or lighting equipment well again it depends what you're going to do i mean if you're going to be in the studio a lot then lighting is obviously useful if you're going to be out and about then cameras yeah, are absolutely yeah i suppose it totally. yes i mean the i mean it's i mean i mean the thing is that it, you know all these things can be rented relatively easily and so you should be and you know, perhaps rent stuff and decide exactly what you want to start with and then and then go from there um you know what what do you, what do you find you're using a lot i mean and, and then buy that i mean that's our policy really is you know we we buy the things that we tend to be renting a lot okay uh apac says do you think that a stills only photographer is at a significant possibly crippling disadvantage in today's commercial market i think we kind of answered that one a little bit earlier didn't we uh, yeah i think so i mean i mean it depends really again the kind of type of market you want to work in but if you want to work in advertising yes i think you probably are cripplingly disadvantaged unless you do something that's extremely unique absolutely um now moving on to that do you think uh you will adapt or incorporate other changes in the business in your business in the future such as 3d renders cgi or whatever else may be round the corner well there is a little bit of cg in the thing that i'm working on today um so we do use it uh as and when we need to um but yeah i mean we take it we'll take of you i mean much as we have taken of you on getting interested in moving image i mean i again cg and things i, I mean i don't can't see it as ever being something i will do myself but um but i will you know there will be a lot of uh you know there will be more and more work that requires me to be working with cg artists right. i'm sure as, as we move forward okay well we've got about um five or ten minutes left and then jonathan's got to get back to work because he's right in the middle of a project but let's take a few more questions um martin platinick says um, he has a question as an upcoming product videographer photographer do you have any advice for starting mainly interested in how to sell both video and photo services together bit of a broad question but maybe you can offer any advice uh, yeah i mean again that's a tough one i mean just i mean if you're loving shooting products then yeah but get yourself a portfolio together and and uh, market it yeah i mean it's uh, a, ca a case of again shooting what you like to shoot um, and making sure that the that you've uh, made the result as good as you can possibly do it um, Simon Vale he's got a, a, an interesting question it says what was the principal message that the client wished to uh, convey with the Grolsch video that we've just watched given how well established the brand is um well i mean the grolsch pop is is something that obviously is a very iconic moment in in any uh grolsch um uh, 
Yeah. Exactly, they're renowned for that, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, um, this, the, the, these films particularly topped and tailed a load of commercials, um, which I didn't shoot the interim bits, um, which were primarily in, in, interviews of significant people in the in the growth business and people around the world. Um, so, you know, the, the commercial would start with the opening pop and end with the closing pop. OK. Um, Something else would be on the 20 seconds in between. Right. Um, Suba says... Hi, Carl, Jonathan. My question is, have you ever got stuck or become blank, confused with what you need to do to take your career to the next level? And if you did, how did you manage to overcome that? I guess they're sort of uh, asking about maybe a sort of creative block. Have you ever suffered with that or felt like that at all? And what, what did you do to overcome it? Um, well, I think we all do, don't we, at times? Um... Yeah, the, I guess, and then it's just a case of, sort of working, trying to work your way through it, keep trying different things, and then eventually you come up with something that really works. I mean, that, I suppose uh, the advantage for you, Jonathan, is that because you're always shooting alcohol, you've got lots of alcohol lying around all the time. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so go, go down to the river, have a glass of wine and think about it. And think about it, absolutely. Um, what have we got here? Um, what could the, the Michael Cosolino says, what was the occasion that made you one of the greatest commercial photographers in the world? <laughs> Raising the eyebrow. <laughs> do, do you feel, do you feel there was a point in your career where you felt I've made it? Uh, no, <laughs> no, gradual, <laughs> a gradual progression. Well, I mean, it's yeah, so uh, and and you know, you still got to keep working at it now. I mean, there's no, there's no real let up. Yeah, um, it's, it's just the, uh, you know, you uh, it it is it is a business where you're as good as your last job. Yeah, I mean, and, and you've been doing this what for thirty years now? Uh, yeah, thirty, yeah, thirty three years now. Yeah, right. Well, mm -hmm. you're still turning out exceptional work, Jonathan. Exceptional work. Um, Dominic says, would you decide the time, uh, who would decide the time for you to complete a project? Is it the art director, the agency or yourself? Uh, I mean, every, every project will come with a timeline. So that will come from the agency because there's generally, you know, a publication date or an air date or whatever for, for I'd the imagine, I'd imagine there's also a budget that restricts the timeline as well. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I mean, it's it's isn't it? Um, yeah, money, time, and whatever is yeah uh, are all interchangeable. So yes, I mean, if you've got money to throw at a problem, then things can move a bit quicker. But if you don't, then then you you have to take take the time that it takes. But um, yeah, it's it's always every every job will come with a time timeline that's predetermined largely, and it won't be determined by me. No, I mean, I'll be I, I they show me the timeline and say is this possible and i i can then say yes or no um and in which case if i say no and they still want to work with me then then we find a way around it right but if if i mean you know there's you know today's project i think they want they were talking about wanting to get it on air by the 7th of april or something well that was never going to happen so now it'll be on air on the 30th of right. april so right that's for um Couple of simple ones for you. What do you most love about what you do, and what do you dislike most about what you do? Uh, what we love is, you know, the joy of some, you know, moments every day where you capture something that's really cool, and it's a bit like scoring a goal. Yeah. Um, and what I really dislike is sort of the amount of unnecessary paperwork that we seem to have to do these days, but. Mm. Mm. And that seems to be growing and growing, but particularly with the with the larger clients and the larger agencies, as I guess it's a an insurance driven thing. Um, all their insurers are demanding more and more right. precautions. So you know, we're the ones down the line that have to fill in the paperwork to help them address that. Absolutely. So you still get a, a really good buzz when you catch that shot, create that image, and just love it. Yeah. Good, good to hear. Good to hear. Um, now. Um, let me just get a couple more questions in before you have to 
uh, leave us. Um, you don't need to tell us specifics, but how is video priced compared to stills? For example, is your day rate the same for shooting stills as video, or is usage far higher for one, or are there many more outsourcing servicing costs to consider that increase a customer's budget for video? Uh, and clients, are they in, in general more accepting of larger budgets for video? Uh, yeah, well, there's obviously a lot more outs outsourced costs. Um, I mean, it's a very, you know, the actual, it's a, uh, each project is unique unto itself. So, um, yeah, it's very difficult to say whether you charge more or whatever. But I mean, the, the thing is on video, you've all got a, generally got a lot more pre-production time that you've got to, that you don't get paid for and a lot more post-production time that you generally don't get paid for. So, you know, you've got to kind of, factor all that in as well so i mean it's it's just generally getting to a ballpark figure that you know you're happy to work for um in in a in a general in a general sense i think um and that's that's the way i kind of work it but yeah i mean the video should really be quite a lot more than still because there's a lot more involved in it now um 12 years ago you would have primarily been shooting stills for billboards, advertising campaigns, magazines, etc. But now, what would you say the split is between stills work and video work in terms of percentages of man hours? Um, oh, predominantly video now, 60-40 maybe. 60-40, interesting, yeah. interesting. Yeah, okay. And, and, and heading, heading north for the video, yeah. Um, Loop One has a photo, says, I've noticed some well-known photographers seem to use 35 mil style DSLRs on location and then medium format in the studio. Is there a reason for this? Uh, it depends really the kind of material they're shooting. I guess if you need to be a bit more versatile and run around, then you're going to be more likely to use a DSLR, whereas, you know, a Hasselblad's pretty tricky to run around it, with, so it is, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I guess, I guess that might be the reason. You know, I mean, if I were to shoot one of my campaigns on location, I'd probably be shooting it on the Hasselblad, but um, I can't, I, I can't uh, answer for, you know, a, gen a general uh, rule of thumb. Um, you know, I would want to be doing mine on the Hasselblad, but um, you know, if you're shooting models running down the river, then yeah, you might want to be on a DSLR. Might need the. Uh faster frame rate and slightly exactly. quicker focus yeah okay two more questions just to finish off jonathan because i know you're a very busy man um when you shoot for stills and then have to shoot a similar theme or setup for video do you work in a different way and accommodate both together or are they completely two different setups from start to finish um i would generally i mean it, if the, if i'm doing a stills campaign and a moving image campaign in the same for the same look and feel of the same campaign, I generally try and shoot the stills first and then emulate the lighting, get the lighting right for the stills and then try and emulate the lighting for the moving. Um, I, th I mean, I don't know whether that's because of my stills background means I'm more comfortable just sort of tweaking and refining everything for the stills and then getting that just right. Yeah. And then take our moving image lights into similar positions. And then all we've got to worry about is the moving. Um, and finally, what advice can you give our viewers who would like to start experimenting with video and filmmaking? Well, again, I mean, I think it's something I touched on a bit earlier. Don't don't be worried about the camera or the technology. I mean, it is just it still is a box that takes captures light in the same way. It has an aperture and it has a shutter speed and it has an ISO. Absolutely. Um, just take more pictures every second. So. Uh, yeah, don't don't be worried by the fact that it's a moving image camera. I mean, it, it it works just the same. If you if you know how to take stills, then it shouldn't be, you know, with some relative amount of understanding of what's going on, rather yeah. than you know, rather than using everything on auto. I mean, it should be you know, it should be a relatively straightforward process for you to to start to capture video. Fantastic, um, Jonathan. Where can the viewers follow you? Where can they see? You? What's your Instagram handle, please, sir? Uh, Studio Knowles is the Instagram. Studio um, Knowles is Jonathan's Instagram feed. Jonathan's website is J Knowles, K N O W L E S. That's correct, isn't it? 
correct. Yeah. <laughs> .com. Um, so if you want to check out more of Jonathan's wonderful work, uh, visit his website, follow him on Instagram. Uh, Jonathan, thank you very much uh, again for appearing here. Obviously, it was nice to have you here in the studio last time. And for those viewers that haven't seen Jonathan's first interview when he was here in the studio uh, discussing uh, a lot of his stills and early career work, uh, you can also check that out on our platform. Jonathan, give everyone a wave bye-bye. Thank you very much. It's Thank been great. Thank as you. As always, thanks, Carl. Cheers. Okay. I'll speak to you Bye. later. Bye-bye.